Okay, Acts chapter 15. Now we'll just read verse number 2 again, Acts 15 verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dis dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. The title of the sermon tonight is Dissensions and Disputations. So it comes from verse number 2 there. Dis uh, dissensions and Disputations. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those words. Dissension means disagreements. Disagreeing one with another. And disputations means disputing. Disputing or arguments. So, dissensions, disagreement. You can disagree with people, okay, but not have an argument about it. But disputations is you arguing about it, right? Things aren't going very well. And what we see here is that Paul and Barnabas are having dissensions and disputations with certain of the Jews. Now, look at verse number one. What were they arguing about? It's, it's quite unusual, but already in this early church, they were arguing about the gospel. Straight away, verse number one, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So they'll add in circumcision, as per the law of Moses, to salvation. You had to, that, they were teaching that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. Now I'm not sure how that worked for the ladies, but obviously that would be something for the men, that they would need to do this in order to be saved. Now, it's, it's amazing how straight away you see someone adding more to the gospel. Okay? From day one till 2018, until the Lord returns, the gospel is always going to be corrupted, which is why it's so important for us as a church and for us as individuals to stand up for the true word of God. But this church, I mean, these, these Jews from Judea were teaching that believing on Christ was not sufficient. And isn't that the same with any like, independent fundamental Baptist churches? I mean, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them believe just like we do. It's by faith alone. It's by grace alone, by faith, through faith alone, on Christ alone. But how many more say to you, that's not enough? How many say to you, well, there's more you've got to do to be saved? No different from these people that came up from Judea. Now, the Bible says in verse number 2, that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. No small. Meaning, it was a great argument, right? It wasn't a small argument. It wasn't a small disagreement. Paul and Barnabas were fighting for the true gospel, which is faith on Christ alone. Okay, it was no small disputation. And let me say to you that the topic of the gospel is no small dissension and no small disputation to us. Okay, it's something that we must stand for. It is the most crucial, the most important doctrine that we have in this church. I would rather be right about this doctrine and wrong about everything else than right about everything but wrong in the gospel. Because it's a matter of eternal life, or eternal damnation? Is faith on Christ alone sufficient or not? Defending the gospel, fighting for the gospel is worth fighting for, okay? Now the question would be asked, well, were these people even saved? I mean, because naturally when we go soul winning, we say, well, we hear people say, well, believing is not enough, you've got to do more. We automatically assume that person is not saved. And it's a good assumption. You know, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. But what you'll find here in verse number five, let's look at verse number five, it says, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So there were certain Pharisees that actually believed. They were believers. They were believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were saved according to the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Ghost is the narrator of the Bible. And the narrator is telling us they believed. Saying, what were they saying? That it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So it wasn't just circumcision, but you've also got to keep the law of Moses. You've got to keep the commandments in order to be saved. Now, obviously, we hear that. We would automatically assume that person's not saved. And, you know, if not for the enlightening that we have of the Holy Ghost that's narrating this, we would, not, we would assume that these people were unsaved, right? But we see that they are believers. And, again, that, that's pretty surprising that a believer can corrupt the gospel so much. They're not even saying you've got to be sorry for your sins. You've got to feel the right emotions. They're not even saying, well, you've got to try to turn from your sins. 
They're, they're outright putting works. They're outright saying it's circumcision and you've got to keep the law of Moses to be saved. Now that should tell you a couple of things. Number one, it should tell you that even saved people, as much as we don't want to admit it, but even saved people can get corrupted on the true gospel. Okay? Now, we don't know who they are, right? If, if we hear a profession of someone and they're adding works to the gospel, we don't know if that person's truly saved. The assumption is they're not saved, and, that, and that's how I would assume. I would treat them as though they're not saved and, and wanting to give them the right gospel so they would be saved. But the possibility is that they could truly be teaching another gospel and be believers as we see in this early church. Okay? So the Holy Ghost confirms to us that they were indeed believers. Look at, look at verse number 6. And the apostles and elders came together for, for to consider this matter. So let me just say this. If the dispute amongst believers, if there's a dispute amongst believers about the gospel, it is important enough for us to get together and work this out. It is important for us to get together and work out what is the false teaching that's, that's come into play and to stand up for the true gospel, which we'll see in a, point, in, in a moment here in verse number 7. So the, the apostles and elders, the apostles and the pastors in Jerusalem got together to discuss this matter. Why was there different gospels coming out of our church? And verse number 7, And when there had been much disputing, so there's much arguments taking place, Peter rose up. Okay, so we already know that uh, Paul and Barnabas were defending the true gospel earlier, but now we see Peter, you know, another apostle stand up, and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by, the, by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So what's he saying? Salvation is hearing the word of the gospel and believing, right? Believing what you've heard. That is salvation. We see Peter standing up that it's, it's believing the gospel, believing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse number 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So how did they receive the Holy Ghost? By believing the gospel. Okay? Verse number 9. And put no difference between us and them, us being the Jews and them being the Gentiles, no difference between us. As much as people want to tell you there's a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, Peter is saying there's no difference between us, purifying their hearts by faith. How were they purified in their hearts? By faith, by believing the gospel. So we see how Peter puts it in two different ways, right? He says they heard the word of the gospel and believed, but they also had their hearts purified by faith. Okay, salvation is by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So we see Peter stands up for the truth, confirming that salvation is by believing, by having your faith on the gospel, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'll say that to you, first of all, because if you are, are talking to a brother or sister in the Lord, and they're messed up on the gospel. Don't worry about talking about other doctrines. There's no point. We see everybody coming together to discuss this matter and working it out. If someone is wrong on the gospel, don't talk to them about end times. Don't talk to them about creation. Don't talk to them about the law of Moses. And don't talk to them about all these other things. Make sure that they get right in their minds the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, by grace, through faith, all on Christ alone, okay? Not of yourselves at all. That's the key thing. You must remember that. If someone is wrong in the gospel, don't waste your time talking about other doctrines because that person may very well be unsaved. Now, they could be saved. They could be saved and caught up in this heresy. But let me just read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Very important. And I feel like this is such an important verse. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4 says, For if he that cometh preach if another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So Paul is warning the Corinthian church not to bear, not to put up with people that are preaching another Jesus, another gospel, or have another spirit. Okay? Those are three things that are major heresies. There's one Jesus, there's one gospel, and there's one Holy Spirit. 
okay? Which you received by believing on Jesus Christ, which we saw in Acts 15. Now, if any believer, anyone that, that claims to be a Christian, may, may be saved, may not be saved, believes in another Jesus, another gospel, or another spirit, you need to make sure if you're going to talk to them and dispute with them and dialogue with them that you keep your, the doctrines, you keep the conversation on those three things. Don't worry about anything else. These are key doctrines that they need to understand and need to believe to be right. And then you'll be able to talk to them about other matters. Okay? What is another Jesus? Well, some people believe that Jesus Christ is not God. They believe he's just a man, he's just a prophet. Who are those? The Muslims? Who else? Jehovah Witnesses? Are there anyone else? Top of my mind. What about the Mormons? Yeah, they don't believe, well, they, they believe he's a God. All right. So these religions obviously have another Jesus. But you guys are pretty familiar, like I'm sure some, some of you guys are familiar with what's going on with the Trinity debate lately in the United States. I mean, look, we're an independent church. I try to keep my nose out of other churches' business. But it's all over YouTube. It's all over the Internet. And obviously this, this whole thing about the Trinity and the oneness doctrine. Let me, just, let me just, for the record, let me just say this. I personally personally, don't have a problem with people using different analogies or certain phrases or certain buzzwords when they try to describe the Trinity, when they try to teach on the Trinity, okay? I'm not against that because here's the thing. There's no perfect analogy. There's no perfect way for you to be able to explain how three can be one and how, how one can be three, okay? Because mathematically, that is an impossibility in our world, in our finite minds. That's, that's an impossibility, we accept it by faith that there's three persons in the Trinity and yet it is one God. We believe that. But what is the name of the only begotten Son of God? What is His name? Jesus Christ. Okay? That is His name. That is clearly taught with Scriptures. Clear Scriptures teaching that the name of the Son of God is Jesus Christ. Now what clear t Scriptures can you think of that teaches that the name of Jesus is the name of the Father, or that the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. Can you guys think of any clear scriptures? Clear scriptures, I'm just saying black and white scriptures that say the name of God the Father is Jesus Christ, and the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. Can you think of any? I can't. I can't think of any whatsoever. In fact, I see clear distinctions between those persons of the Trinity. And so if someone comes to me and tells me that the, the name of God the Father is Jesus Christ and the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, and yet what I see in Scripture, the clear name of, the, of Jesus Christ, the one that it belongs to, is the only begotten Son of God, then is that not another Jesus? It is another Jesus. Okay? That's not as crazy as believing that he's not God or that he's just a man, he's just a prophet. I understand that. But it's still far enough for me to say that is another Jesus and I want nothing to do with people that teach that other Jesus. Why? Because I think they're unsaved devils? No, I don't think that. Okay, I, I don't think that. Because we can see here that these, these Jews that were putting works to, to the gospel were still saved. They were messed up. So it just proves to you that in our flesh we can accept heresies and teach heresies. Right? But it's far enough for me as, as the bishop of he, this church, the church in Caloundra, to separate myself from that because I'm supposed to protect the flock in this church. I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm accountable to God for this church. And if we're warned to not to bear well with people that teach another Jesus, then I'm sticking my nose out of that. I want nothing to do with people that teach another Jesus. And I will divide over those things, okay? I will divide with people over another Jesus, another gospel, another Holy Spirit. Okay, what's another Holy Spirit? I think of the Pentecostal churches, right? This Holy Spirit, they get revelations from, from the Holy Ghost and they've got these new revelations from God and yet those revelations contradict the Word of God. Who wrote the Word of God? The Holy Ghost moved men, right? To write these words, to pen these words. So if you've got a, a revelation from what you call the Holy Spirit and yet it's contradictive to the Word of God, that is another spirit. Okay, and I will not have anything to do with people that have another spirit. Okay? I mean, even, even believers, remember when, 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 uh, when, when Jesus went to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. What spirit was influencing Peter? And yet Peter was saved. That was another spirit. And at that point, Jesus had to say, Hey, get thee behind me. Right? 
So this is still my introduction. I just want to get through these things, okay? If someone claims to be a Christian and they're messed up with another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, you focus on discussing on those matters. Forget everything else. These things are so important, okay? And obviously another gospel is a damnable heresy. Okay, but let's look, let's look further on. Let's talk about believers that are like-minded, like faith. Believers that agree that salvation is by, by grace through faith on Jesus Christ alone, his death, burial, and his resurrection. Okay, like-minded. Kind of like how Barnabas and Paul were like-minded, right? Both of them were united, disputing against these Jews that were adding circumcision to the gospel. But yet we see, later on in this chapter, verse 36, look at verse 36, Acts 15, verse 36. We see a divide between brethren, like-minded brethren that were working together. <laughs> you know, Barnabas and Paul are probably the, the most like-minded you're going to find, okay? But look at verse 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them on this missionary journey to confirm the saints. And then look at verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them. So Barnabas wants to take John Mark. Paul says, no, I don't want to take him. Why? Who departed from them, from uh, Pam Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Now if you want to understand what happened, when Paul and Barnabas were in Jerusalem and, and went on their missionary journey, John Mark came with them, okay? But then halfway through the journey or when they got to this town, John Mark went back. You know, he didn't finish the work, okay? He didn't finish the work. And you can read about that in chapter 12 where John Mark joins them. And then in chapter 13, you read about how John Mark departs back to Jerusalem. Okay, so you can see that Paul's a little bitter about that, you know, a little bitter that John Mark didn't, didn't go all the way with them, you know. And then look at verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them, that's between Barnabas and Paul, that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So we see Barnabas... He, he has his, you know, he's willing to give John Mark a second chance. He's willing to go and pick up John Mark, encourage him, get him re-motivated to go out and do the work of God again. Such is Barnabas, okay? And yet Paul, what do we see? You see, Paul, you know, he's had his chance. You know, I, I've lost trust in this man. You know, he, he could do it again. You know, we could make a lot of effort to bring him along. But again, he might pull the plug and go back home. I don't want to risk that for the kingdom of God. I don't want to risk that for the work of the Lord. Okay? So we see two great friends dividing over John Mark. Now, who was right and who was wrong? You know, that's for you to think about. You know, the, what's interesting is the scriptures don't tell us. The scriptures don't tell us Paul was right. They don't tell us Barnabas was right. Maybe they were both right. Maybe they were both wrong. Maybe one was right, one was wrong. The scriptures don't tell us. All the, scriptures does for us, all the scripture does for us is record what took place. Okay? Now let me just say this to you. Okay? These are like-minded believers. They've been working together. They've been fighting fights together against false gospels. And yet even as like-minded believers, they got to a point where they couldn't agree and they had to go separate ways. Okay? Now here's the thing that I want you to think about. Neither of them got discouraged. Both of them, Barnabas took John Mark with him and went to confirm saints in one area. Uh, it, it says, um, unto Cyprus, and then it says, Paul chose Silas. So this was a great opportunity for Silas to be mentored and trained by Paul, okay? And they departed, uh, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So we see what happens here is that even though these two couldn't get along, even though those two are uh, split, they still put their heads down and went to do the work of the Lord. Okay, they didn't get discouraged. You know, Barnabas didn't go on YouTube and blame Paul. And Paul didn't go on YouTube and blame Barnabas. They just divided over it and they kept doing their work for the Lord. Okay? Now, the reason I think the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us who's right or wrong is just so we can learn from this and understand even with the apostles, 
even, okay, in the early church there were divisions. And that means in 2018 there's going to be divisions amongst brethren. And I know we don't like that. I know we don't like the thought of like-minded believers not getting along. You know, this church not wanting to work with that church. This pastor not liking that pastor. We don't like it. And we could turn around and say, well, yeah, but, you know, if we work together, we could do so much. And that's true. But we could do so much as well if we divide. And what we see is that the work doubled. Instead of it being one team confirming the saints, there were two teams going out confirming the saints. Okay? But obviously, in the book of Acts, we do follow the journey of Paul. Okay? Barnabas takes a back seat afterwards here. All right? So, you know, are you a Barnabas or are you a Paul? You might be one or the other. You know, I think I'm a bit more like a Barnabas. I think I'm more willing to give people a second chance, give them the benefit of the doubt, you know. And yet you might be like Paul and going, no, you know, the kingdom of God is way too important to give someone a second chance. We're doing it without him. You know what? Both of them were able to still continue to serve the Lord and be about the Father's business, okay? Now, here's what's interesting about this. If you can turn to second... Yeah, actually, yeah. Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I just want to show you one thing here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, while you're turning there, let me just say, obviously, Paul did the greater works. Obviously, Paul gets a lot more recognition in the Scriptures than Barnabas. And yet, did you know Paul wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Barnabas? You know, if Barnabas wasn't that guy that gave people the benefit of the doubt, wasn't that guy that was willing to give people... Because remember, Paul was murdering Christians. He was gathering Christians and persecuting the Christians, and believers did not want anything to do with, with Paul. And yet it was Barnabas that came and said, hey, no, I vouch for him. You know, he's, he's a believer. He's saved. That's Barnabas. And Barnabas might be thinking, come on, Paul, I gave you a chance. Why can't you give John Mark a chance? You know, that's the kind of person Barnabas is, all right? And I like, I like Barnabas because he's not the kind of guy that gets jealous. You know, he, he was more important and, you know, than Paul in the early days, you know. He was the one that mentored and, and, and taught Paul the gospel and got him saved. But yet Paul rises up. The Lord exalts Paul above Barnabas, but we never see Barnabas get bitter about it. You know, I'm sure he's even delighted by the fact that his convert is now doing great, you know, exploits for the Lord. Okay, that's Barnabas. I, I like him. I'm probably a little bit like him. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. So Paul is writing to Timothy, which is a pastor, and then he says this, Do thy diligence. Are you guys in verse 9? 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 9. Do thy diligence and come shortly unto me. So he's asking Timothy, can you come and see me? For Demas hath forsaken me. So there was a worker called Demas that has left Paul alone. He's, he's, he's forsaken Paul. Having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So he's saying, look, my fellow workers, they're not with, with me. I'm pretty much alone. He goes, only Luke is with me. He goes, only Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is with me. But then look what he says. Take Mark, that's John Mark, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> you know, he has this big fight with Barnabas about John Mark. Barnabas says, well, I'm going to take him and I'm going to... And look, that's Barnabas. You know, he took him under his wing, he trained him up, got him, you know, got him back in the work to the point where Paul looks at Mark now, John Mark, and says, wow, he's profitable to me. Can you bring him alone? Because I'm only with Luke. I need more helpers in the work that we're doing. So again, if not for Barnabas, you know, Paul would not have John Mark to his, to, to his aid later on in his ministry. Okay? So I'm just showing you you know, sometimes there are believers that are going to divide. Lord willing, hopefully they'll just unite once again. You know, it could be many, many years later. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter if there are people that want to work with us, pastors that want to fellowship with us, churches. It doesn't matter if they do or do not. We have our work to do. Okay? And both Paul and Barnabas show us that example. It doesn't matter the disputes. We've got to do the work of the Lord. Now, turn to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Because I want to talk to you a little bit about how to handle doctrinal disputes with fellow believers. Doctrinal disputes. Okay? That's where you believe something about one doctrine and yet someone else that's a fellow believer. I'm not talking about another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel. I'm just talking about secondary doctrines 
when you have disputes of them. You don't see eye to eye on those doctrines. Let's get some advice from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 25, verse 8. Proverbs 25, verse 8. I'll just give you a moment to get there. Proverbs 25, verse 8. Now, I know these passages are not about doctrinal disputes. Okay? These verses. I understand that. It is a little bit about disputes. But I think there's a lot of application that we can take from these passages. As I was reading through it, I thought there was a lot of good truth that we can apply to having a dispute between a brethren. Okay? First of all, look at verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive. Okay? What's strive? To strive, to cause a strife. Don't rush to cause a strife. Lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Okay? So, the past, this verse is saying, don't get involved in doctrinal discussions to cause strife. Okay? Now, again, I want to take this context of fellow believers, like-minded believers. We're not talking about another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. Okay? We're not talking about those things. Those things need to be called out. You know, uh, I understand that, but I'm just talking about secondary doctrines here. So don't rush to cause strife. Don't get into a discussion just to cause problems. Okay? It will lead to strife, but if you go in ill-prepared, you go in hastily, you go in rushing, it may be to your shame, okay? Because you've not prepared for the discussion, okay? Or you're not aware of what the discussion's about, and you come in and you throw your two cents, you know, causing further trouble without first understanding the whole picture. Listen to the position that you disagree with. Now, I know that's very hard for the flesh, very hard for the flesh to listen to someone give their opinion about a doctrine or about a position in the scriptures that you disagree with. But if you don't go in hastily, you, you, you give it time, it's important for you to listen why people believe differently on a passage or on a doctrine. Okay? So that way when you enter the discussion, without haste, when you enter the discussion, you give a measured response that's applicable to the discussion. I've seen so many people get involved in a discussion, ramble on, you know, very zealous for the truth. You know, I'm not against that. Very zealous for the truth. But then they talk gibberish. Like it has nothing to do with the, with the discussion that was being had because they've entered hastily to their shame. Okay? So be patient when you enter a discussion. Look at verse number 9. Proverbs 25 verse 9. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. Let me, let me just pause for a minute. On Sunday I preached about, you know, if you have a dispute, if, you, if you've been offended by a fellow believer, what are you meant to do? Go tell all your mates? No, you're meant to go to them alone, right? This verse basically supports that. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. Okay? Now, I, I don't want to talk about that again, but it says, uh, and then it says, and discover not a secret to another. So again, you know that offense between you and that neighbor? Don't go and tell others. Don't go tell that secret to others. No, take it to that person himself. So when you're having a doctrinal dispute with somebody, keep the discussion with your neighbor alone. Okay? Remember Matthew 18. Remember what we read about and what we learned about in, on Sunday. I believe we can apply that as well with doctrinal disputes. Or keep it within the circle of those that are already involved in that discussion. Okay? Keep it within the people that it's relevant to. Don't publicize. Okay? Don't go around publicizing the fact that you have this disagreement with this brother. Now, you know what I'm thinking about? Facebook. I'm thinking about YouTube. That's what I'm thinking about. Because, let me tell you this, I've seen, and look, I've, done, I've made this mistake as well where I've entered into doctrinal debates and disputes on Facebook, which is a public platform, okay? I'm not saying just secret conversations, you know, your personal messages. That's okay. I'm talking about when you enter into, you know, someone posts something and you don't like what it says, and instead of going to that person privately and saying, hey, you know, I have an issue with what you've posted. I think this is a problem. You know, you take it publicly and you rebuke that person publicly. That's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to take it to that person himself. And I've seen so many disputes on Facebook. And let me tell you this, I've never seen one side relent and say, yep, yeah, brother, you know, you were right. 
never, I've never seen it. But you know what I've seen and what I've, what I've experienced is when someone comes to that person privately in love, not wanting to make this, you know, you know embarrass them in front of everybody that has, you know, has nothing to do with what's going on and address it and for that person to take down that post. And I've, I've seen that happen, okay? I've experienced that myself. I've experienced where I've gone, someone's posted something that I, I strongly disagree with. I think it's... Uh, I can think of a few, few occasions and I've, and I've contacted them privately, I explain what the problem is with what they've posted and they've taken it down and just thanked me for it. Okay? But what, hap what would happen if I went publicly and posted re rebuking what they've, what they've posted? Do you think they're going to back down? No, because the pride of man, the flesh, is going, and, and it's just going to be back and forth, back and forth on a public platform, just totally uh, destroying that person's reputation, maybe even your own, maybe to your own shame. Keep these things in mind, okay? And discover not a secret to another, it says in verse number 9. Look at verse number 10. Lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infam infamy turn not away. Okay? Why? Because your poor behavior in involving other people not associated with the discussion will see you in bad light. It'll, what does the word infamy mean? Do you guys know what it means? It's kind of like famous but it's infamy. It's been, it's been, um, it, it's uh, been known for a negative thing. It's been known for something bad. Okay, so it says there in verse number 10, and thine infamy, infamy turn not away, meaning that your reputation is not going to, it's, it's going to be bad. <laughs> your reputation amongst others, because you've done it on a public platform and not to that person alone, is going to look bad upon yourself. Okay, look at verse number 11. I love verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Okay? A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Meaning that you want to ensure your words, the way you discuss doctrine, are fitly spoken words. Fitly spoken words. What does that mean? It means it's, it fits. Okay? It's appropriate. It's considered the question. It's considered the opponent. It's considered the other position. So when you respond, it's a fit response. It makes sense. Think of it like a puzzle piece. You know, you're putting a puzzle together. You know, you find the right piece. It takes time. You can't rush a puzzle. It takes time to find the right puzzle piece. And then when you fit it in, it fits perfectly. That's how your response on a doctrinal, doctrinal dispute ought to be. The way you speak ought to be this perfect puzzle piece that answers the questions and supports your position. Okay? Now it says that a fitly spoken word is are like apples of gold. Now I'm not sure why you want apples of gold, but it's apples made from gold, um, which is obviously valuable, very pretty, in pictures of silver. So I'm assuming this is like an ornament, you know, like a, a beautiful or rare, expensive ornament. Something that has much value. It's very rare. The way you speak ought to be valuable. Okay, the things, especially when it comes to doctrinal disputes. Okay, don't be full of hot air. No, the words you speak ought to fitly fit, ought to fit the conversation that's at hand. Okay, how much value, let me ask you this, how much value do you add when you speak about doctrine? How much value do you add? Or are you full of hot air? <laughs> You know, how much value do you add? Because here's the thing, you can speak a lot and add no value. Or you can speak few words and add a lot of value to the discussion, okay? But a fitly spoken word requires that you have listened and understood the question. That you have listened and understood the other person's position, okay? Or the questions they have, okay? Don't be quick at the mouth to respond. Listen. Pay attention, okay? Don't be overzealous to speak over somebody just because you think they're wrong. You might not even understand what they're talking about just yet. And, you know, you're not answering in a fit way. Let me give you an example. I'll just read to you Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2.12. I'll just read this to you. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with free, fear and trembling. Now, what does that mean? I mean that, that, what that mean? We know that salvation is not by works. 
Okay, we know that. So what's it, what's it saying? It's saying that when you're saved, work out that salvation. Work out your faith. Make sure it's not just a dead faith. Make sure you have some works to go with your faith. Go from faith to faith. Walk in the Spirit. Do the things of God. Not to be saved, but because you are saved. Okay? We, that's how we understand that verse. But what if someone came and said, you know what, and, and this happens, you know, this happens. People read that verse and go, well, well, you know, brother, what does this mean? It says you've got to work out your own salvation. Can you please explain what that means? And then you, being overzealous for the gospel, which is the right thing, you might even give the right answer, the right responses. You might be upholding true doctrine, and you say, well, you know, of course salvation is not by works. It's by grace through faith on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And, you know, in, in your zeal, you speak loudly. In your zeal, you speak over that person, and you affirm that salvation is by faith and not of works, and you feel good about it. Yes, I've defended salvation. But you have, have you answered their question? Have you answered their question where they're asking you? They're not asking you. They agree with you that salvation is by faith alone. Which is why they've come to this verse and asking, how do we understand this verse? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's not a fitly spoken word. Yes, you've defended the gospel, praise God. But it, you've not answered the question. You've not helped them understand that passage. Because you've, you've rushed in hastily without first listening to what they're saying, okay? And, and your words aren't like apples of gold in pictures of silver because you've not spoken a word that fits what they're asking, okay? Let me give you an, another example. A couple of weeks ago, I had a friend who I know is saved, 100% saved, but was stuck on a few passages that sounded like you could lose your salvation. Now, I, I could very quickly just go, well, of course you can't lose your salvation and ramble on all these verses about how you can't lose your salvation. Okay, but what did I do? I asked further questions. Can you please help me understand why you think this might be talking about lo losing your salvation? I then showed them certain passages in scriptures and I didn't give them the answers. I just said, look, read these passages and tell me what you think these passages say so I can have a better understanding of why they're starting to think you, maybe these verses are saying you can lose your salvation. Okay, and now I could, I could just go on the attack. I could just go on the attack about how salvation is once saved, always saved, and can, never can be lost. But I want to answer their question. I want to make sure my answer is fit for what they're inquiring about. Okay? And sure enough, I asked them, they, they responded to what... what and, and by them responding, it helped me understand where they were coming from. Because once you understand where they're coming from, once you understand why they're, they're, they're being you know, fooled, then you can actually answer the question and not just reaffirm that salvation can never be lost, but actually explain to them the passages that they're struggling with. Okay? So make sure that when you get into doctrinal disputes that you listen to the other side. Okay? Listen to the other side before you let your, your zealousy get out of hand. Now look at Proverbs 20, uh, 25 verse 12. Verse 12. It says, As an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold, so, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. So to reprove is to show the error of their ways, to correct, to make manifest their error. Right? That's what it means to reprove. Okay. Now, if you want to be a wise reprover, okay, because that's what we, we don't just want to reprove. Okay, we want to be a wise reprover. It says if you do that upon an obedient ear, the person hears what you have to say and changes their position onto correct doctrine. It compares you as an earring of gold, okay to that obedient ear that they've got. Okay, now, an earring on, it, on its own, obviously, is, is useless. But an earring upon an ear beautifies the ear. That's why women put on earrings, because it makes your ear look more beautiful. Okay, it kind of decorates the ear. And I don't know why some Christians are against earrings. I mean, the Bible seems to be okay with them. You know, it's fine. But, anyway, that's got nothing to do with it. But I'm just trying to show you that if you reprove someone wisely, have fit-spoken words that are valuable, okay, that adds something to their discussion, then together, the reproved and the reprover can be this, like, this, 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 this ear that's been beautified by the earring, okay? Okay, it's something, it's not just to show them how bad they are. It's not just to show them how wise you are and how smart you are, no. It's to get together and work things out together, just like how the earring goes with the ear. It's not about how I can destroy them, 
How can I destroy their doctrine? How can I destroy them? No. How can I improve this person's understanding? How can I ensure that my words, my feedback is valuable to them? Because here's the thing. If they feel like you're not hearing them and you just reprove them and you're not even answering their question, then they're less likely to come to you again and ask a question. But if they feel like they've been heard, that you've been patient, you've listened to them, and you've given them a wise answer, they're going to be more likely to come to you a second time with other questions that they may have. Okay? Look at verse 13. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him. For he refresheth the soul of his masters. We won't talk about that. But verse 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. So if you boast in your knowledge, okay, when you're having that dispute with them, you know, you boast, it says that you're like, you're like uh, clouds and wind without rain. So, I mean, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of noise, but no substance is what it's saying. If you're just boasting yourself when you're having disputes with people. You know, it's kind of like people that say, oh, you know, I've read the Bible 20 times. You know, and, and like, because you want your answer to be valued, you know, you start boasting in yourself. You know, I've read the Bible 20 times. You know, I've got this many degrees in a Bible college. You know, and I, I sometimes see that, like, on comments on YouTube and even on our sermons. You know, I think there was one guy that says, oh, I've got, like, four degrees in, in this Bible college and, you know, and, and gives me an answer to something. I'm like, who cares? You know, who are you? I'd rather listen to a babe in Christ that just believes the Word of God and is not boastful in of themselves. It doesn't impress anyone. You boasting about how smart you are in the Scriptures does not impress anyone. It only impresses yourself, but it doesn't impress anybody Else, you know, boasting is a lack of humility. When, you, when you're boastful, you're lacking humility. And here's the thing. If someone asks you a question, or you're having a dispute about doctrine, and they show you a verse that sounds like it supports what they're saying, but you don't have an answer, just be honest. Just say, I don't have an answer for you. Hey, that's a good one. That's a good one. I don't have an answer for you. Let me get back to you when I've spent time to look at it and, and to study it out. Don't be so boastful to think that you're going to have the answer on the spot because it's, it's, you're going to look foolish, okay? You're going to look foolish and it's going to be a shame upon you. Look at verse 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. So let me just quickly, the second part, the soft tongue breaketh the bone. I believe what that's saying is, you know, obviously a bone is hard, but soft words, kind words, you know, being patient with somebody, is, is going to cause that hardness to go away, to break, okay? I think that's what that second part is saying. But it says, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded. So what does it mean to forbear? If you say, I'm, I'm forbearing, it means you're holding back. You're keeping something back, okay? By long forbearing is a prince persuaded. Here's the thing. If you're having a doctrinal dispute with someone, you don't want to bombard them with so much information that they can't take it in. They can't absorb it all at once. You want to have long forbearing, okay, to persuade someone. Meaning, give them a little bit of information, then hold back. Later on, give them a little more information, then hold back. Be patient so they can understand and they can work through to get themselves out of that heresy or out of that false doctrine, out of that false belief. Take time. It requires patience. I mean, think of some doctrines you know now and think about how long it's taken you to get here. And yet sometimes we don't have the patience with other people and we think, why can't you see this? You know, but you forget how long it's taken you to get to where, get you, you know, where you are today. Okay, so it requires patience, long forbearance when you're talking to people. And I'm reminded of Isaiah 28 verse 9. I'll just read it to you. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. You've got to wean them with milk, okay? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Here a little and there a little. Learn that. Learn that it takes time. Learn that it, it's a little bit by a little to teach someone doctrine, okay? They've got to start from the milk and work their way up, okay? Be patient with people that disagree with you on doctrine. Win them over. Have fitly spoken words. It requires patience. Verse 16. Look at verse 16. 
Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. What does that mean? So if you eat too much honey, eat only what, what's going to be sufficient for you, because if you eat too much, you're going to throw up, you're going to vomit. How do we understand that in what, what, what we're reading? You know, make sure that you don't become obsessed with one doctrine. Make sure you don't become so obsessed about the one thing. I mean, have you ever come across a believer that all they do is talk about that one doctrine? You know, whether it's end times. I mean, flat earth, that's another one that comes up. You know, um, the Jews or the, or the Trinity. You know, always that, that same topic over and over and over. It's like they've, vom they, they've, they've studied so much. They've, they've spent so much time on this one doctrine and just, it just spews everywhere. Okay? So make sure that you're a Christian that's balanced with much different types of doctrine. And you're not just always talking about the one thing because people are going to get sick of you. <laughs> people are going to get sick of you talking about that one thing. Look at verse 17. And I think verse 17 is very important. It says, Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee, and so hate thee. Now obviously this is talking about overstaying at someone's house. Okay? Your neighbors invite you, invited you, you know, don't overstay your welcome. The same thing with doctrine. When you're talking to someone about doctrine, be perceptive. Okay? You might have had a dispute and you find that the person doesn't want to talk about it anymore. They're over it for a while. You know, they might even ask you nicely, hey, can we not talk about this anymore? Yeah, you know what? Withdraw your foot from your neighbor's house. It's time to pull back. You can discuss it another day. Because if you don't pull back and you keep hammering them over and over and over again, it says that they're going to be weary of thee, they're going to get tired of thee, and hate you. Okay? You think they're going to come back and talk to you about doctrine again? No way. So be very perceptive with how people are responding to your teaching. All right. Now, I'm almost done here. Let me just say a couple of things. When you're discussing doctrine, let me just show you some, some key things that I've learned. When you're discussing doctrine, okay, make sure that you use clear scriptures that don't just support your doctrine, but plainly teaches it. Because anyone can find scriptures that supports them in what they believe. Anyone. It doesn't take a lot of skill to have scriptures that supports your position. But it takes effort to find scripture that plainly teaches what you're teaching, what you believe. Use those scriptures to convince the gainsayer. And if you find your doctrine does not have clear scriptures that teaches it plainly, guess what? Pull back. Pull back. Because if the Holy Ghost has not made it crystal clear, then it could just be your opinion. Okay? It could be just your doctrine. Hey, it might be right. But obviously, you're not going to find crystal clear scriptures. Don't dispute over that. Don't fight about it. There are plenty of doctrines that are crystal clear, that are plainly taught in scripture. Number two, don't make an argument from silence. Don't make an argument from silence. Let me give you an example of this. You know, you might, and I've used this stupid example a few times before in my old church, but I could say to you, you know, the Bible never says you can't be saved by eating an orange. The Bible never says that, which means you can be saved by eating an orange. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible doesn't say you can't be saved by eating an orange. Therefore, because it's silent about that, I can be saved by eating an orange. That's an argument from silence. Don't get into that habit. It's so tempting. Because, yet, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot in here, but there's a lot that's not in here either. And then it's like you're, you're, you're creating doctrine for things that aren't even in scriptures. It's very tempting. Don't rely on conjecture. Don't rely on your conjecture. Now, what does that mean? Because there are things in the Bible that are plain that you can see, but then there are things that kind of leave you to your imagination. Kind of like, was Paul or Barnabas wrong? Who was wrong in that dispute? The scriptures don't say. But you might have your opinion, but your opinion is conjecture. It's not scripture. So don't base your doctrine or your argument on your opinion. And make sure, it's, again, it's clear scriptures that you're using. And number four, especially if you're talking to a friend, someone that you know and you care about, Make sure that you present your position yourself. Yourself. Don't give them a video to watch. Don't give them a book to read. Don't, sh don't point them to a preacher that they may not like. They want to hear from you. Because if you're pointing them to some sermon or some video, that just shows me that you're not even that confident in the doctrine yourself. Because if you were confident enough to get into a dispute about that doctrine, you have to be confident enough to show them from the clear scriptures why you believe what you believe. Okay? Now, 
after all of that, you've sat down with someone, you've, you've had doctrinal disputes, and you're just not seeing eye to eye. You know, you spent a long time, now what? What's the next step? Okay, let me, let me give you some, some, some advice here. Are your views, you might have differing views, but are your views contradictive? That's a good question. Are your views contradictive? Now, if they're not contradictive, then the truth is you could both be right. <laughs> you might be arguing about something that you're both right about. Because here's the thing about the Bible. It has multiple applications. Okay? You might take a verse and you might apply it this way. Or that person might apply it this way. And if you guys are arguing about how you're applying that verse, that's very foolish. Okay? Because the Bible's very deep. It has many layers. So first of all, is it contradictive? If it's not contradictive, why are you disputing? Okay? But if it is contradictive, you've got to realize one of two things. One is wrong and one is right, or you're both wrong. That's a possibility. You're both wrong. Okay? Think about it. Now, um, let me give you some advice of how to lose a debate, how to lose in a discussion. Even though you might be right, you might be right, and that person might be wrong, but let me tell you how you can lose that discussion or that debate. Number one, be the first to claim that you believe the Bible. You believe the Bible, implying that they don't believe the Bible. Well, you know, here's the verses. I just believe the Bible. What are you saying? You don't believe the Bible. Now, is that true? You're talking to a like-minded believer that's just trying to get to truth, just trying to grow in knowledge, and you say, well, I just believe the Bible. You know what? You've lost the argument at that point. Because that person obviously believes the Bible as well. They've just come to a different realization than you have. A different interpretation to you than that verse. The second one, and we discussed this already, is you can lose an argument when you speak over your, your opponent. When you don't allow them to express what they believe. And you just speak over. You find something wrong and you speak over them and you correct them immediately. Rather than just giving them the time to explain. Because they might have the answer further along the line that you were going to criticize them over. Okay? Again, that's another way to lose an argument, when you speak over the person that you're talking to. The third way to lose an argument is to misrepresent. To misrepresent or create straw man arguments. Do you guys know what I mean by straw man argument? You create a straw man, something that you can knock down, but it's not what they believe. It's not what they believe. But you just assume, if you believe that, you must also believe all these other things. And you create them out of thin air, and then you destroy all those other things. But that's not what they believe. It's not a fitly spoken word anymore. Okay? Three ways to lose an argument. Okay? Three ways. Tell them that you just believe the Bible, implying they don't. Number two, speak over them. Number three, create straw man arguments and misrepresent their position. You've lost it. You might think you've won, but you've lost the argument. Okay? Finally, what if my opponent just doesn't come my way? You might say, Kevin, you know, I was discussing this doctrine with this person. You know, everything that I, everything that I brought up, they had crystal clear scriptures to support what they were teaching. You know, everything they showed me was crystal clear scriptures from the, from the scriptures. Everything that I brought up, they could answer with crystal clear scriptures. What do I do now? Well, have you considered that they might be right? And you might be wrong? I mean, if they're able to present their argument with crystal clear scriptures and everything that you bring toward them, they can answer, then look, there's a high possibility they're right. And you've got to consider, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, and that's very hard, very hard for the flesh, very hard for pride to say, hey, I might be wrong. And yet, you know what? I promise you this, all of us are wrong about something. I promise you that. We're all wrong about something. And then secondly, let's say... Let's say you, you, you know, you're right and they're wrong. What do, you, what do I do now? What do I, they still haven't come my way. Let me just end with this. You've got to ask yourself the question, how crucial is the doctrinal difference? How crucial is it? How important is it if they believe this, they believe A and I believe B? Think about it practically. Now let me give you one example. The Jews. Are the Jews today, in 2018... God's chosen people, okay? Because they're going to find Baptist churches that will tell you they're God's chosen people. But I'm here to tell you that only a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ are God's chosen people. Whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, it, there is no difference, as we read in Acts 15, right? But think about it. How crucial is that? 
Because most people that believe they still are God's chosen people will say to you, or you, you ask them a question, so when they die without believing on Jesus Christ, where do they go? What are they going to say? Hell. Number two, would you give a lost Jewish man the gospel? Do they need to hear the gospel? They'll say yes. We agree with that. So we agree that someone that's lost, a Jewish man, regardless of what you call them, they need the gospel, and without the gospel, they're going to, to, to go to hell. Okay? We agree on that. So what are we debating then? The title. We're, all we're debating is the title. You want to call them God's chosen people, I don't want to call them that because I believe God's chosen people are saved believers, whether Jew or Gentile. So all we're arguing is the title. Because both of us know without Christ they go to hell and that they need the gospel to be saved. How crucial then is that argument? You see? I mean, look, I mean, obviously they can go all the way out like a John Hagee, believing that they don't even need to hear the gospel and, you know, we need to support Israel no matter what they do. You know, obviously I'm not talking about that kind of person. I'm just talking about just a, a believer, a like-minded believer, but just has a different view on whether we should call them God's chosen people or not. You know, at the end of the day, that's not so crucial. It's not so important. It doesn't change you in your practice. You're still going to give them the gospel. You're still going to understand that without Christ, they're going to go to hell. So is it worth disputing and dividing over? Okay? So always make sure, if you can't see eye to eye with that person, think about we disagree, what's the practical implication? How important is it? But if it's something like the gospel, it's got huge ramifications because they're teaching damnable heresies, something that's going to damn people to go to hell if, if people are trusting in their works. And um, So that's all I've got for you today. I, I know it's a bit long for a, for a Thursday. I've had a lot of thoughts. I, I cut out a lot of things I wanted to talk about. But I just hope that's given you some ideas about division, about having a, a discussion, and just being being patient with people, you know, don't, don't just destroy them and blow them out of the water because they believe something wrong. Be there to help them, okay, be there to help them, be that Barnabas to help them, you know, and, uh, and, and be Paul at the same time, where, where, the, where the work is important. The reason we want to get them to, 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 to get to a place where they're right on doctrine is so they can be more effective for the work of God. Just like, you know, uh, Paul took John Mark later on, you know, he found him to be profitable for him. So let's pray.